Well, hello, everybody. This is Dave Berkus for the Berkus Report for Ion Business. Every time we meet, we have a chance to talk about things important to you and to your business, no matter what the stage. Your business could be a very early stage small business with just one or two employees, or a later stage business taking outside money from outside investors, requiring much more discipline. Today, we're talking about the Board of Directors and how the Board of Directors adds value to your company. Well, I wrote a book about that called Extending the Runway, and Extending the Runway talks about these things we're about to cover today. And they are the five resources that great boards supply, along with some tips from experience that I've had over doing all of this. Although in the short period we have, we won't talk much about tips, but I'd like you to remember these five kinds of resources. They are, remember five, time. Time is corporate time, meaning the way in which your critical resources are allocated, not necessarily you and your own time management. And then relationships. A good board of directors should be able to open a golden Rolodex or PS2 file or whatever you want to call it today and get for you the names of people that will help you advance your business. Number two, time and relationships. Number three is process telling you, teaching you how to get from here to there in the most economical and quick way. Many of your board members, if you choose your board members for, uh, correctly, will know how to do this because they've done it before, even if you have not. And if you might think about it for a minute, if you can get a product out the door or sell things faster or whatever your goal is for the moment, you'll save money because you're saving rent, you're saving fixed overhead and the people who work in the back office. All of this is compressed if your product gets to market or your sales begin faster or whatever the goal is. So number three is relationships. Number four is context. And context means the board helps you decide that you are in the right place at the right time with the right product at the right price. And that context is something that you may be, I don't want to say this carefully, or I do want to say it carefully, kind of blind to. Because often an entrepreneur is so very focused on the product and on the company that the entrepreneur doesn't realize that the people out there have done it before, priced it cheaper, done things that are going to challenge the company to a degree that your board members may know better than you. And then number five out of five is the one that seems most obvious, and that is money. Board members can supply it. More likely, they'll help you to raise it. They'll introduce you to people who can give it or <laughs> loan it or invest it. And those five things are the things I want to remember for you. And they are time, relationships, process, context, and money. So we'll have just a little bit to talk about each, but not much time at all. Time is the deliberate overcommitment of your critical resources. And if you do that, we call it time bankruptcy. Time bankruptcy is just as bad as financial bankruptcy because at that point in time, you may not be able to react as a corporation as you should to the needs that you have to have. For example, your chief programmer is involved in fixing issues if you're a software company and doesn't get any time to build new systems. That is an overcommitment of the critical resource. Many other things like that can happen in almost any time of a company, and time bankruptcy is the opposite of using time wisely. Relationships. It's the same thing as the flip coin of going it alone. So the board member's golden Rolodexes covers the ability to find more people for you than you could find for yourself. It leverages those contacts correctly because there is already a relationship between a board member and you and the, and the uh, person that you're contacting. Third, process is getting from here to there safely. And safely is the important word here because sometimes you can get from here to there by overspending and by allocating resources you shouldn't and doing things that will be difficult for the company to recover. But notice that the process has an interrelationship between time and efficiency. So all these things are interrelated. That's why I told you the five of them twice. I have a question that I ask every third or fourth board meeting to the CEO, who or what is your bottleneck? Big important question, because a bottleneck is something that will hurt both the process and the time in getting your company to market and saving your company money in fixed overhead. Who or what is your bottleneck? Would you think about that? Even a very tiny business, do you have any bottlenecks that if you got rid of those bottlenecks, everything would go much more smoothly? Everybody does. Sometimes, by the way, the bottleneck is you. So there is a way of using process as a competitive advantage. FedEx is a great example. 
they were able very early on to decide to show that they could get something absolutely, positively overnight. Many people use process as a competitive advantage. Then there is context. Are you in the right place at the right time? Where is the market? Where are you? Are you flying against the prevailing winds? And if so, will it take twice the amount of effort, twice the amount of money to get your product to market or to make it successful? Your pricing strategy. Years ago, and I'm speaking 30 years ago, I developed a statement called, where there's mystery, there is margin. And what it means for you is if you can find something that you do or some product that you have that other people can't buy for themselves other, uh, elsewhere, understand for themselves if it's a service, you can price it at a higher price, making more margin in the meantime. Where there's mystery, there is margin. Find where your mystery and your product is and know that you can charge more for that product. And then finally, when we speak about context, are you too soon? Are you too late? That's one of the things a board can help you with that you might not have helped you with before. And finally, the final one is money. And uh, the biggest thing to say is never run out of it. Your company's value goes way down. Your options go way down, meaning the options of things that you can do. And so running out of money is just what we tell you not to ever do. And second, I like to teach the demand pull versus the cost push. What this really means is, it's not the way that uh, John Kenneth Galbraith met it when it was originally stated. It is instead that it is your opportunity to find where the marketplace is using a small amount of money, and then with that small amount of demand, put the money that you have behind marketing to that market niche. Demand pull. Otherwise, you're making generalized marketing efforts across industries you don't know will accept your product or service, and you're finding yourself spending an awful lot more than you would otherwise. Never use short-term borrowings to pay long-term debt. That one you have to think about. In other words, if you have to borrow money uh, in a one-year note or a six-month note or something you have to pay back even sooner than that, don't go out and lease a car or buy an asset with that kind of money. You'll find yourself unbalanced. You'll be having to pay very quickly for things that you'll use for a long time. And then a final lesson is there is a math to tell you that growth calls for more cash, not less. That doesn't sound intuitive, so you'll have to think about that one. If you double your sales and it's a while before you collect your money, you'll still be paying your rent and payroll and other expenses as well. You'll need more cash to do that because you'll have far more accounts receivable and it's coming in later because of that. So it's a discipline, and the discipline usually results in your learning how to forecast cash, sometimes for the very first time. So there are 300 more of these. They're in these Borkonomics books. I'd like to be able to teach more to you, and that's why we're here. And so at the next Burkus show, we'll do more of the very same thing and tell you stories as well. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Well, hello, everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Today, we're going to talk about your favorite subject. How much is your business worth? Valuing your business, no matter what the size. We do this as an exercise as investors because we want to know that we have paid the right amount of money for your business as we invest in it so that we can grow at the same point as you grow as well. So today, we're going to talk about valuing a pre-revenue business one that hasn't yet the ability to judge its value based upon its revenues and its profits. And many of you are building new businesses and wonder how much your business might be worth before you have any revenue. And so years ago, I developed something called the Burkus Method. It wasn't named by me, and I'm happy to have it named for me, but it was meant to be an easy, simple method that was almost too simple to ignore. It was named by Howard Stevenson, of Harvard University in a book called Winning Angels back in 2001. And that, that name stuck. And people have been using the Burkus method as one of the several methods of valuing a pre-revenue business for years. But for me, it's kind of a way, as a simpleton that I may be, to value a company as if you were a simpleton. Well, maybe that's not fair. It's widely published and widely quoted. And it is for very early stage companies. Remember that as we talk about this. So what is it? There are four elements of the Burkus method. Number one, and each one of them, by the way, is given a valuation at a maximum. In other words, if I as an investor believe that your idea, that your business can be a real success, 
and it might be able to get to, say, $20 million of gross revenue after five years. That's pretty good. Even before you have a dime worth of revenue, I'm going to give a valuation start of $500,000 for your business. And we'd scale that down if the business were smaller and had less of an opportunity. Number two is the good management team. And that means you and the other people that you've gathered before you or around you to build this company. In my case, what I try and measure is can this management team get this company to break even? And break even is a proxy for stability, as I see it. So I'll give up to $500,000 in valuation if I believe the current management team can get this company to break even. Pretty, in, pretty in different, or pretty different, isn't it? And then number three is I'll give up to 500,000 additional dollars if there is a strategic alliance that shows value. What it means is some customer has said, I love this idea so much that if you have it in the marketplace, I'll buy 10 of them, or I'll use your service, or whatever it is. That validation from a customer that we can see and talk to is worth up to $500,000. And it has to be a genuine customer of size that can scale your business or help you to do so. Number four, and this one is uh, just as important, is completed product or prototype takes away the risk, the technology risk, that you can actually do what you say you can do. That's worth another 500000 or something between zero and 500000 So count those before we get to number five, and you'll, you'll find that there are four ways of earning up to $500,000, making $2 million of pre-money value before a nickel has been sold. And then the fifth one is, well, you get into revenue, and sometimes we add value in this formula for revenue. But often, revenue creates the need for you to have to begin forecasting that revenue to see what the value is. This chart is impossible to see, I realize, but it was drawn by a person in 2005 and published along in several websites. And I'm showing it just to show you that what this person has done is to attach the group responsible for each one of those things to a kind of a graph to show that it can be done and who is responsible for it. So what have we done? We've created an early valuation so simply that if an investor uses this formula, they can create a value of anywhere from $300,000 to $2 million out of a company that has projected revenues, but we have no idea whether they will achieve them. Because what we did was put a number on the reduction of risk. Think about that. If I reduce my risk that you can get to break even, I'm willing to pay you more in value for the company, therefore taking less of a percent of the company as I invest. Now, 20 years after I invented the Berkus method, I have just recently revised it. Now, I've revised it to make two things change. Number one, there is a reality that we have to realize. If you're in the Silicon Valley today, that $500,000 maximum for each one of the two yields a $2 million maximum valuation for the company. It isn't nearly enough for the way companies in Silicon Valley are valued today. And so because the living expense is higher, the cost of business is higher, hires for new employees are more expensive, that 500000 should be scalable to something more reasonable. And in the Silicon Valley, that might be a million five, making a $6 million valuation maximum rather than a $2 million. But if you're in one of the states like Kansas or Missouri, the $2 million may still hold just fine. The other change that I made was there are lots of companies that don't need these four things to be the measure. For example, you have a medical device company, and you're not worried about getting to market. You're worried about getting FDA approval in the early stage of your company. And so substitute for the marketing issue a $500,000 or less valuation for getting FDA approval stage one or something of the kind. You've got the idea. Those two changes make it a little bit more complex, but a lot more flexible. This is how you might value a business before the point of the first dollar of revenue. It's how an investor should be able to look at your business and do the same. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. This is Judith Simon Prager. I've developed Verbal First Aid, and you are watching Facets Television. I'm Tim Jamal, President of the Board of Trustees of the South Orange County Community College District, and you are watching Facets Television.
Welcome to Facets Television, and we have with us today Judith Simon Prager. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you have a very interesting field that you work in. Can you describe uh, both the title of it and then uh, what's involved in that? Thank you. We teach, I, with a partner named Judith Acosta, we teach something called verbal first aid. Verbal, 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 verbal first, first aid, aid <laughs> is how to speak in medical emergencies to change the outcome. When someone's in an emergency, they go into an altered state of consciousness. Yeah, okay. They are, their prefrontal cortex, which is their thinking brain, yeah. gets hijacked by their primitive brain, and they forget how to think and they're almost in a trance. So everything you say to them becomes a suggestion. I train firefighters, police officers, doctors mm -hmm. all across the world and across the nation in how to speak when somebody's in an emergency. But the really important thing about the Shan is that anybody can use it any time because it could be that a child is injured, the car in front of you goes out of control, Grandpa walks across the floor and grabs his heart and falls down. What you say at that yep. moment, this is the important part, changes not only the chemicals that go through his body and his ability to heal, but how he remembers the incident. Does he remember it as a trauma? Is it the worst thing that ever happened? Or does he remember it as a time of rescue? And maybe even a time when he exerted his own courage. And that makes a difference both in the present and in the body and in the future in terms of PTSD. So, there's, so, yeah, it's so, so there's a big challenge with this that I see. In other words, you describe the state of mind of the, of the victim, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the crisis worker it may be just as scared or just as you know, uh, traumatized by the event as anybody else. So how do you work with them to get them to be able to follow your techniques? Well, you see, that's why we have a protocol. Because okay. when you, it's not just knowing exactly what to say, but it's knowing how to approach someone, how to center yourself. Yep. The first step is centering yourself and remembering you're there for a reason. You have everything you need right with you right at that moment because presence is the most important gift you can give anyone who's injured. Okay. When somebody's injured, they think to themselves, if they can think at all, if it's not brain damage, okay. if they've been hurt, they think to themselves, what am I supposed to do? Oh, no, my life is ruined. Oh, no, my arm is broken. Oh, no, I fell off the roof. Whatever they're thinking. And they think there's something they're supposed to do. So they make adrenaline and cortisol, and they get all worked up, okay. and their heart palpitates, and they breathe heavily, and everything goes wrong. If somebody else is there, just even presence, okay. so takes presence. their hand especially yep, yep. and says, I'm right here. Oh, I'm relaxed now. You see, <laughs> they can give, turn it over to you. They don't have to feel bad. And you don't have to know but how to But how do you actually CPR. train the people to follow the techniques? Because you, you, you obviously know a lot about this, but how do you get that information across in a short period of time to the people who are going to be the crisis interveners? Well, first of all, are you helping me advertise my books? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have three books on the subject. We have The Worst is Over. The worst is Over. Verbal First Aid and... Howie Cadabras. Howie magic. Cadabras somewhat magic. Kids. Okay, great Somewhat title. magical way to heal yourself right, and your fantastic. friends. So the, the crisis intervener can read the books. But, but I also I give lectures all okay. over the world. I've been in... In China, they had a an earthquake that killed 80,000 people. And they brought a crisis team first. Okay. And then after they left, they had me sit with them for a while. Okay. What was happening was parents, mothers especially, who had lost their child as the school collapsed, and they're only allowed to have one child and are 40 years old and don't know if they can have another, were committing suicide. Yeah. And they didn't know how to talk to those people. And it's not like you can solve it. It's not like you can yeah, say, oh, exactly. you know, exactly. adopt a child. You can't, there's nothing you can say. But as I stood there and tried to figure out, one woman came up and she turned her back on me because the crisis counselors in China do it on the phone. And she said, I can't see the person, so you can't see me. And I said to her, tell me about your daughter. And she pretended to be the person who had lost the daughter. And she said, she's four and she loves to dance. And I said to the, the, the therapists in the audience, People like to talk about someone they lost because it keeps them alive. And then I said to the woman, you know that she lives. She lives in your heart. And that, when I realized, I'm getting goosebumps saying it, yeah. when, when, I, when that came through in an, as an idea for me, what I realized was that's a reason for her to stay alive. Don't commit suicide. Keep the memory of your daughter alive. You're the one who's here to do that. So uh, that was, that's not really as so much verbal first aid as just 
figuring out what to Just say in the moment. Basic empathy, right? Basic empathy yeah. and rapport are the building blocks yeah. of verbal first aid. And then there were words, the special words to say. I, I mentioned two of them. One is, I'm right here. Okay. When a child falls, as soon as a mother or an adult says, I'm right here, okay. the child just looks to see, should I cry? If they're upset, then I'll get upset. But if the parent <laughs> or someone says, we're right here, we can take care of this. So aren't you then the crisis worker applying first aid to the crisis intervener? I mean, you're, I mean they're scared too. Um, you know, they're potentially in a panic. They, make it, they could easily do the wrong thing. They may be suffering from some of the same things as the victims. Yes. We learned this from 911, right? I mean, the, cri the crisis workers there, the interveners, were had as much trauma as anybody. Yeah. So they look at you as their crisis worker, right? It's really true, and I train a lot of 911 um, dispatchers. Okay. I was just in North Dakota for a nine-hour training of 911 okay. dispatchers. I did it in Rochester, New York. Okay. So, yes, when you train them, because they have very little training. They yep. don't have, yep. they learn CPR. They're often volunteers. That's right. And so... Yes, you have to teach them how to take a breath, how to find yeah. out their center before they even approach someone. But what and I'm thinking is you say, I am here to them, right? I mean, you're their security <laughs> blanket. You're their first aid or band-aid or whatever. Right? I, thank you for saying that. Actually, the title of one of our books is The Worst is Over. And that's one of those things that's true and comforting. When somebody's injured, if you say the worst is over, what you're saying to them is, now we start to put you back together okay, again. Okay. Yeah, okay. you fell, you hurt, yep. you're, but we're gonna, we're right here to help fix it. And so I, what you just said makes me think that probably that's what I'm saying to the crisis workers. Yep. I'm yep. saying to them, the worst is over because I can give you a protocol that will allow you to know what to say and to, to be a hero, to, yep. to help somebody else. And, and sometimes had, it's very simple. And you had the magic words, I'm here now. You know, that's, and that's one a, of them. I'm right a, here. I'm know? right here. And that's a change from when you weren't there, and it's a big change. You can right? turn over the fear and the concern to me because I know what's going on. Yep, yep. Do you, I've you know, done this before. Yeah. Do you know that, um, do you remember when Gabrielle Gifford was shot in the head at, yep, a, at yep. a, um, very much so. It was horrible. She was a Congress person and she yep. was shot. She had an assistant who had only been with her for a few weeks. He was not medical. Yep, yep. He didn't know anything about medicine. She shot in the head and he sits down next to her. He takes her hand. And he sits with her and waits. I mean, he didn't even know anything what to say. And he sits with her and he waits for the EMTs and paramedics to come. And I have a picture that I use when I give my lectures. Okay. He's holding her hand as they're putting her, her on yep, the yep. stretcher to take her. He won't let go. Yep. And I really believe that she recovered from the most critical injury you can imagine because she was able to turn over her fear and her belief that somebody else, and there was somebody not even equipped, and that's most of us. I have never been, I have to admit, I've never been at the scene of an accident. But everyone I've trained, I get letters every day, people saying I did it and it worked. And I, one woman heard it on NPR. I bet one of you out there is going to hear this and say, I'm going to find this out and do it. <laughs> she heard on NPR what to say. She was in an accident within a week. She said the right thing, yep. took care of the mother, took care of the children, waited. She was the point person for the police, for everybody, used this, the woman's cell phone. She, did, she was calm. She did everything, and she wrote me, and she said it resonated with me. I heard it. So let me ask you, a lot of this sounds like, when you talk about the untrained and people that have never been through an accident before, it sounds like helping people just get back to being basically human, the natural instinct <laughs> to help or you know, be neighborly or friendly or caring. Well, there's, what, what is it beyond that? Yes, there's one really major rule, and that yeah. is, uh, I'll give you a quick uh, example. Close your eyes. You don't have to. We always say this, though, in hypnosis. Close your eyes and picture any animal in the kingdom of animals, any animal you like except elephants. Don't think about African elephants with the big ears, <laughs> and don't think about circus elephants. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about elephants Snake because in the sentence... <laughs> You're thinking about, in the sentence, don't think about elephants. You're thinking, there's nothing else. You, there's nothing else to think about. There's nothing else to picture. So there, a little kid comes to you and he's going, oh, my stomach hurts. If you say don't vomit, you might as well duck and cover. <laughs> Maybe you never thought of vomit. Maybe you never, vomit, oh, there's a thought. Now there's a useful tip right there. <laughs> yes, it's very important. This is what we say. Say what you want to have happen and not what you don't. Ah, okay, that's Whenever a good one. I grandpa like that, yeah. grabs his heart and falls down, and you say, don't die. And he thinks, 
die. Could I die? I thought this was just pain. Well, you think it's a loving thing to say, don't die, but you don't want that picture in his mind. And he is, because he's in an altered state, that's a suggestion. So, okay, so let me ask you. So you've got books, you do lectures and so forth. Um, this is a lot of information for people to digest. If they want to learn more, what would you suggest they do first? Well, the books are the most accessible, and, and I'm okay. not pushing them. I'm That's just okay. saying they, they exist. I have some things on my website. It's just okay. judithprager.com, and there's some okay. interesting things. And um, there's even a verbal fa first aid for kids part of the okay. website. They, there's songs, and there's parts of this book shown. And so all the kinds book's of the things. website, and uh, they can contact you, I assume? And you know what else? I just was called to one of the schools five schools in Los Angeles to talk to teachers about how to talk to kids about lockdown. When you say to a kid somebody could come in this school with a gun and shoot you, that kid's going to have nightmares forever. How do you talk to them and let them know that this is more like a fire drill and more like helping you feel safe? So I teach teachers how to talk to kids okay. too. So you teach a lot so of people. So anyone how to do can this. say to me, can you come to my group? Uh, yep. I I love communicating this Apparently, so yes. much. We, we, get, we get that. <laughs> <laughs> so much that it's not even, you know, like a job and how much yep, money. Yep. And it's just, the thing that I love about it is that people go off and do it. Well, and I'm sure that's what they love about you. So <laughs> thank you for entertaining our audience and giving them some leads into how they can follow up, whether it's through the books or your website. It's been a great pleasure having you on here. We could probably go on for a couple of hours, but... Uh, I know you have a history of this, too, yes, and I know you're... my wife and I met as volunteers at a crisis center, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're disciples already. So thank you very much for Such sharing your pleasure. knowledge with thank our public. Thank you. This is Shan Steinmark, and you've been watching Facets Television. <laughs>